Friends, good morning on this beautiful yet chilly autumn morning. Fall is a com coming in all of its splendor and glory, and here we are gathered together. Whether we are in person in the sanctuary or you're joining us from home, we are one church united together in Jesus Christ. And we remember that Jesus welcomes every single one of us, you, to this table of amazing grace. We are also reminded this morning that we are all the baptized children of God. In the scriptures, John says that Jesus is the light of the world. And in Matthew's gospel, Jesus looks at you and says, you, you are the light of the world. Friends, it is incredible to be with you, and I'm excited to have Pastor Shanna give us an update about Trunk or Treat last evening. Pastor Shanna. Well, Trunk or Treat, we've been talking about it for a month and a half, and it happened last night, and it was amazing. It was so great to be doing something tangible for the community. So I want to give a huge thank you for all the people who brought cars and decorated their trunks. We had nearly 20 for the deacons who did a fun pumpkin patch. Um, we think we had 75 or so cars that came through in our two-hour window, and we gave out about 150 or so bags of candy. I think there's some pictures up here showing you what we did. Um, I have to tell you that we had several people from the surrounding neighborhood that told me that they normally come to Trunk or Treat year after year and were a little disappointed that it wouldn't be the same, but loved last night and they were so appreciative that we would do something like that. We also had brand new people to the neighborhood that have just moved here and they were super excited that there's a church that does fun community events despite all the challenges we have had lately. So thank you. I believe you can see way more pictures on our Facebook page as well. I also want to remind everyone that tonight at Transform Youth Group, beginning at 6 p.m., we have a special evening planned, not just for our youth group students, but also for any of you who come to the 6 p.m. service tonight. So I don't want to give too much away, but you really won't want to miss it. It's going to be a great evening of sharing and collaborating and just loving on one another. So we hope to see you all there. Shanna, thank you for an incredible evening last night. I had the joy of giving candy to children, and for about two hours, uh, I forgot about a pandemic and noticed children's smiles and the appreciation of parents. So if you bought candy, if you shivered out in the cold yesterday for two hours because Shanna wouldn't turn the heat up, <laughs> if you by any ways participated, know that you brought joy to children in our neighborhood. And from the bottom of, of my heart, thank you. And can we thank Shanna and her family ministry team? Friends, today we join with Presbyterians, Lutheran, and Reformed Christians worldwide as we remember the Reformation when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, 503 years ago. But churches today, on the Sunday nearest to uh, All Saints' Eve, All Hallows' Eve, we remember that Reformation, and if you're interested in church history, our good friend Fred Ritzema will be joining us Sundays in November, following worship in the Van Wyck Room, in person and on Zoom, uh, with login information attached to the Thursday email. We would love to invite you to that. Additionally, small announcements on small reforms to our practices amid a pandemic. I want to remind you of a few things. Uh, we'll finish my sermon series on Reformation today, and then next Sunday is All Saints Sunday, where we will remember the names and the memories of our loved ones who are in the kingdom of God. Just a reminder that we are moving all of our outdoor activities indoors, and I have heard from a few of us 
who are concerned about the rise of COVID cases here in Idaho and have said, Kevin, we love being in person, but we just need to be at home. And I want you to know that we at Covenant, me, Shanna, the session, we affirm however you are living this pandemic. So if you need to take a break from in person just to stay healthier at home, that is okay. But if you need to be here and worship, we think we're going to be here uh, at 10 o'clock for a while. So we just keep praying, keep wearing your masks because that's how we get to gather and worship. And thank you for your cooperation with that. We're looking for new lay readers, so if you're interested in lay reading, if you would be in touch with Dana Chamberlain, she would be happy to schedule you for the spring, and we are teasing this out for a few weeks. We're establishing covenant care teams because it might be a dark winter, but how can we share covenant love? How can you bring joy to one of our friends here at Covenant? Stay tuned because more information is coming. We have our next art fair coming up, too. So we are asking all the artists out there, whether you're 2 or 92, to do some sort of art for us with the theme, Emmanuel, God is with us. We had some really exciting submissions to our last one. So it doesn't just have to be a painting or a drawing. We had wood carvings. We had quilts. We had cross-stitch all kinds of fun things. The deadline for this new art fair submission is November 15th, and then we will be posting them on our pillars out in the foyer for everyone to see when they come to events here at Covenant. Two more quick announcements. This Thursday, our book club will meet physically distanced with masks in the foyer to talk about the book Woman of Troublesome Creek. That'll be led by our amazing Dr. Lois Ortman. I'm really looking forward to that conversation, and if you haven't read it yet, you still have time. In my busy schedule as a dad and work, I still hammered this out in two days. You can do it. And then next week, uh, next Sunday, I mentioned was All Saints. We will be celebrating communion both here in person and virtually at home. So if you'll be joining us from home, be sure to have some bread and some juice so that you can be ready to join in the communion of saints. As I shared earlier, today is Reformation Sunday. Our first hymn is A Mighty Fortress is Our God, penned by Martin Luther himself. And I encourage you to pay attention to the lyrics as Susan sings for us, because Luther penned these words in the midst of a Reformation when he thought he might be executed as a heretic. But amidst all the turmoil in his life and all the chaos and anxiety in your life, Luther reminds us to turn to the mighty fortress that is our God who sustains us. Sisters and brothers, let us worship the Lord our God.
Jesus. Thank you for cranking up this Reformation song on this gift of an organ. But did you notice in verse 3 uh, where Luther is writing about Satan's power and how we can endure Satan's evil and doom because one little word can fell him. What is that word? Jesus Christ. It is in Christ that we find our life and our hope and our love. For all those times we've looked to our bank accounts and vacations for our happiness, let us confess our sins and return to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways according to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, that you don't have to earn your love or your salvation. As Christians, we believe in a God who loves you deeply. And we even in the midst of your sin where maybe you deserve to be chucked aside, right? Our God of Jesus Christ pursues you and loves you. And if you would return to that love, you would taste and see that the Lord is good. Because when we turn to Jesus, we can be certain that our sins are washed away. That the path to eternal and abundant life lie close at hand. The good news of Jesus, you are loved and you are forgiven. So what do we do with this love? Let's listen to this incredible song as Audra and Anna leads us. morning. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 1. It can be found on the overhead screen. 
Let us pray. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Help us now to hear and obey what you say to us today. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The two ways, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of the Lord. I know you've heard this one before, so I'm not going to tell you to stop me. But you've heard this joke. How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? Does anyone know? Change? We don't change! But on this Reformation Sunday, we celebrate the big change in worldwide Christianity that happened with Martin Luther and John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli 500 years ago. And in last week's sermon, I shared about how our lives are a natural progression of change and evolution and growing. And we can observe this in the natural world, right? With the change of seasons. So as we think about Martin Luther and that big change that happened 500 years ago, this is not the only significant change that happened in the midst of Christianity. I think Luther draws his heritage from the original reformer. You know who I'm talking about? Jesus Christ. There's another JC too, Johnny Cash, and he's up there. But Jesus Christ is the number one reformer. And here's why Jesus is a reformer. You know that Jesus is not a Christian, right? He's a Jewish rabbi, a teacher. And his primary mission is to point God's people that the Israelites believed were themselves, but there's this idea growing that maybe God's people encompass everybody and that the religion is not just 613 rules to follow, but maybe there's something deeper Indeed, I believe Jesus Christ is our original reformer. And I think the heart of his message is summed up in Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, beginning at verse 34. Sisters and brothers, listen deeply for the word of the Lord. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them a lawyer asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Jesus is not saying anything new here. He's quoting Deuteronomy. And then he goes on by saying, this is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This first reformer, Jesus Christ, is reminding God's people that the essence of God's people is love. Loving God Loving your neighbor. If you get this love concept, all the rest falls into place. 
But how often do we forget that? How often does Jesus' disciples forget that? Jesus, the original reformer, isn't looking to do something new for the sake of doing something new, but reminding us of that which is important because we are such a forgetful species. This day, we join with Lutheran churches in town, Presbyterian churches in town, Reformed churches in town, remembering the work of that other reformer, Martin Luther. And indeed, Luther changed uh, with the other reformers the movement of Christianity in the world. The whole Protestant Reformation comes about when Luther nails his theses to the church door. He inspires people like John Calvin, that attorney from France who found his home in Switzerland, Ulrich Zwingli, others who reminded us that our faith is very personal. And you don't have to depend on the priest to read the Bible to you, to tell you what you should do. But if you can read the scriptures, you can find this uh, relationship with God, not through an intermediary like Starcher, but on your own. Because Luther, Calvin, Zwingli articulated this notion that your faith is yours. And this faith of yours is that which will save you as you turn to our Lord Jesus Christ. But the Protestant Reformation is one of many big reformations in the history of the church. 500 years ago, Luther, right? 500 years before that, the Great Schism. 1054, the bishop in Rome excommunicates the bishop in Constantinople. Bishop in Constantinople is angry. He excommunicates the bishop in Rome. And there, in 1054, 500 years before that, we had the big division of the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. You know those Russian Orthodox churches here in town, the Greek Orthodox churches? They find their beginnings not 500 years ago like us, but 1,000 years ago. 500 years before that, there was another big split in Christianity over the understandings of the Trinity and Jesus and the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Uh, some Ethiopian Christians, some Christians in Syria uh, formed churches apart from the Roman Catholic Church, apart from the Eastern Orthodox Church, around 431 and 451 B.C. 500 years before that, Jesus. Are you on to something here? 500 years, there seems to be something major that happens in our faith. So, if the Reformation was 503 years, let's do some math. That brings us to 2020. So there are some scholars that I'm pretty intrigued by who say every 500 years, the followers of Jesus realize that the Holy Spirit may be up to something new. I'm one of those people. In fact, I believe that we are living in an incredible change in Christianity. And here's why. Let's take the pandemic out of the equation, right? Let's pretend like we're in February 2020. Okay, so if you are older than me, you realize that church as you knew it growing up is very different than the church that you find it now, right, here in America? Because in 1960, America saw the peak of its participation in religious activity. Indeed, in 1960, all the mainline Protestant churches, all the white Catholic churches were full because... That's what you did as a good American, right? That's not the case anymore, is it? Realize that I'm speaking um, largely to an audience, um, a generation ahead of me, those listening at home. Where are your kids this morning? Are they in church? Some of them are. But I would guess for a significant majority of our children... They're not in church, nor are they watching online, because a generation later, church seems to be different. And how do we describe this 
difference. I want to show you a few graphs to share with you why I think we're on the cusp of significant change in Christianity in America. This first graph is being released um, by uh, PRRI this week. I was able to get a sneak preview of it. But there are three lines on this graph. If you're watching on home, at home, the first line is white evangelical Protestant Christianity. Beginning in 2008, up here, 21.4% of Americans identified as white evangelical Protestant. 11 years later, in 2019, that number is 15.2%. For us mainline Christians, we're actually seeing a little increase beginning in 2017, um, but really not a lot, right? And then the gray line beneath that is white Catholic Christianity. Just over the past 11 years, um, participation in our churches, on the whole, going down. Now, this is probably, most likely because of this next slide, growth of religiously unaffiliated. So these people from 1976 to 2016 aren't not Christians. These are people who just say, I really don't belong to any religion nor identify as such. In 1976, that number was about 6% of the American population. In 2016, that number is 24%. Of Americans don't identify with any religion. What do you think about that? Interesting. Now, next slide. Let's break that down by age demographics. If you are 80 or older, really only 8% of you would identify as religiously unaffiliated. But if you go down to that age group just below mine, 18 to 29, if you are 18 to 29 years old in America, 38% of you would say, I don't adhere to any religious affiliation. So what's going to happen, you think, as the, these generations get older? We will see more and more people not affiliated with Christianity. Back in February, Barna, a research company here in America uh, who follows church statistics, uh, published these findings. Church hopping is increasing. Church membership is declining among young people. And a full 10% of Americans deem the Christian church as irrelevant. And not only irrelevant, a percentage of those 10% think that we do bad things in our culture. It doesn't seem like Christianity is on a good path. But remember... We're at that 500-year mark. I think the Holy Spirit could be up to something. Church hopping is this idea um, that you go to a church, you don't like what the pastor says, someone said something mean to you, so you go to another church where you don't like the music because it doesn't speak to you. So you go to another church where people are nicer. Are you picking on to a theme here? Indeed, I do think church is becoming more about me. But a few more statistics from Barna in the midst of a pandemic. In July, surveying Christians across the United States, they found that one in three Christians in America have stopped participating in church since the pandemic. And this statistic is not just people who are not coming in person, it is everyone, including all those people who are watching online. Barna is saying, if you're watching online, you're participating. But Barna is finding that one in three of us, since this whole pandemic began, have just stopped. The second item, as many as one in five churches in America could close. Now, here's my own understanding of the statistics. It is based upon uh, what faith leaders like me are saying about their finances in their congregations. So I don't know that one in five churches are going to uh, close in the next few years, but the statistics do say that 78% of pastors and Christian churches of all kinds across America are significantly worried about their long-term finances in their congregations. 
Does this apply to us? I'm really grateful for you and for this congregation because I think that Covenant has experienced uh, a significant amount of participation, whether in person or online. Thank you. I'm really grateful and hopeful for our long-term things and for our finances here at the church. We're going to end this year in the black. And for the next few weeks, we'll be talking about stewardship over the next year, uh, which is kind of like shooting in the wind, right? What's 2021 going to hold? I don't know. But I have great faith in these people who have stepped up in the midst of a pandemic that I am not concerned about our long-term finances. But overall, Christianity in America, where are we going? I think a lot of these issues have to do with a terrible heresy that maybe you adhere to unconsciously at least a little bit. Back in the early 2000s, Kinda Creasy Dean, a uh, professor of theology from Princeton Seminary, published a book called Almost Christian, Why Young People Are Turning Away from the Church. Almost Christian, Kinda Creasy Dean. She writes that there is this undergirding theology that is terribly present in many churches in America that is really the God of this religion is not Yahweh of the Bible, but really is the individual self. But she calls this pseudo-Christianity moralistic therapeutic deism. It has five basic tenets which as I read them to you, you might say, oh, well, these don't sound bad. But here they are. Five tenets of this terrible heresy present in American churches. Number one, the first tenet of moralistic therapeutic deism is that there is a God who exists, who created and ordered the world, and watches over your life. You all probably believe that, right? This is not evil in and of itself. But the term deism implies a God who creates and steps back. A God who is not actively part of your everyday life. Deism just says, oh, there's a God who watches over it uh, and orders it. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Again, This is not a bad and evil statement in and of itself. But for those of you who have read your Bible, is this what God wants of you? To be nice, to be kind. God wants that, but God wants way more than that. God wants your heart. And God doesn't just want you to love other people, but what's the first commandment that Jesus said? You shall love the Lord, your God, with Not just 10% of your heart, all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. This is the first commandment according to Jesus, reminding those disciples, reminding you that primarily your job is not to be kind. Your job is to love God and then to love your neighbor as yourself. The third tenet of moralistic therapeutic deism, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Oh, I think this is maybe the most damnable of all the tenets of this heresy of moralistic therapeutic deism. But let's reflect upon our hearts. We like to be happy, right? We like to feel good about ourselves. If you come to my office, I will love you and I will support you. But the basic premise of Christianity is not for you to be happy. The Westminster Confession says that the primary purpose of your life is to love God and enjoy God forever. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that the primary purpose of your life is to be happy. But let's be self-critical. How many of us operate this way? I want to be happy. I want to hear music that I like. I want to hear something that the preacher affirms my preconceived notions about the political happenings happening in the world. And if he doesn't agree with me, I'm just going to find a different church. The central goal of one's life is to be happy. This is damnable, my friends. 
Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. This is a continual uh, perpetuation of the heresy of moralistic therapeutic deism, rampant in our lives. God wants to be inexplicably involved in every aspect of your life, right? This is what the Bible teaches us, but how many of us operate going about my daily business. And, oh, Lord, there's a pandemic, and why don't you solve anything? I'm going to come back to that point in a little bit because this is where I think we're going to lose a lot of Christians post-pandemic because we've been praying, and the cases just keep going up, right? So if you have a marginal faith, what do you do with a God who is supposed to interact with you when things go bad and who is not interacting with you on your timeline? And then number five, good people go to heaven when they die. And we like to believe this, right? But again, this is one of those damnable heresies of Christianity because God, uh, Luther, Calvin, Starcher, any good Bible reader of the world today uh, says that if you're going to get in on your good works, well, who gets to draw the line? And how many of us are really that good to get into heaven? You see, Christianity in opposition to this underlying heresy found so prevalently in American Christianity says there is nothing you can do to get into heaven on your own. You get in only because God loved you first. Those, so there's these five concepts which on their own don't seem terribly evil, right? I would say most of us probably adhere to some of these beliefs maybe a lot, in our everyday lives, but you come here to be reminded of the true gospel of our Christian faith. You see, moralistic therapeutic deism has become so prevalent in our culture. Kinda Creasy Dean says that many of our teenagers who hear this and it's sometimes perpetuated by churches, they grow up and go out into the real world where they experience a plague called COVID-19, and they cry out to this God who is supposed to fix all of their problems, and the problem just seems to be getting worse. And people say, well, God doesn't seem to be answering my prayers, and all y'all Christians are too worried about who you're going to vote for to really give a darn about the hearts of people that I can find my happiness in other ways. And more and more people leave the church. Are you with me on that? But God doesn't give you what you want. According to this theory, you just go to the next thing. Now, we know that this fails and breaks down. We believe in our hearts that the only true peace and grace we receive in this difficult and mysterious life is by our love in Jesus Christ. So if the church is undergoing a reformation, which I believe it is, where are we going? So let's pin some observations of mine. If you didn't know already, things are a-changing. Church doesn't just look different than when you went to church as a kid, but reformation is here. We're in the midst of maybe 12 to 18 months of wearing a mask in church and not being able to sing hymns. And this is terrible, right? It feels really bad. But the Lord promises never to leave nor forsake us and change. We don't like it, but it's already here, my friends. What are we going to do with this change? And I believe that this season, especially with the pandemic, is a season of refining for all of those marginal Christians who were showing up twice a month, one to two times a month, some of those folks that covenant has lost in the pandemic because they found other things to do on Sunday morning. Um, it's likely we're going to lose them long term. That doesn't mean we should stop reaching out to them just means that they've been given a terrible theology for which to build their life that failed them. So they're not going to participate anymore. So as people leave, I want you to also know 
the people have been coming here for a variety of reasons. A few weeks ago, we had some visitors who said, I'm just glad that y'all are having church in person. Great, thank you. There's a family who attends our um, family service who says, thank you for encouraging mask wearing because we have a very at-risk child um, that we want to come to church for. And wearing masks, whether people like it or not, help us to feel safe to come to worship. People are coming for a variety of reasons. So even though we may lose some people, I think in this season of existential angst, we're going to find more people come through our doors who are hungry for something deeper than what the material world can offer. For as long as we put our faith in princes or medicines, we lose out on the real experience of a transcendent spiritual life. And I believe in this season of refining, and that we don't necessarily like, God is going to use this for incredible growth. And the church, y'all are growing. Y'all have proved that you're ready to commit to the ministry of Jesus Christ by your fidelity uh, being connected and in your giving over the past years. God's going to do some growing. So what does this mean for the church abroad in Christianity? A few things. I'm a way better pastor than a prophet. As Paul says, we only see through a glass dimly. So reject anyone who says, oh, this is exactly what the church is going to look like in 2024. However, I do believe that the American church, as we lose people who are interested in hiking on Sunday mornings and mimosas, that the church is going to return to its fidelity to Jesus Christ as we've witnessed a political season on both sides use religion in terrible ways. You know, I have my atheist friends across the, side of the other side of the country who say, y'all Christians would be good people if you actually listened to Jesus, but instead you're way too focused on politics and dividing people. And you know what? He's right. So churches that cling to their faith in Jesus Christ, these are the churches that will grow because there's a generation behind me that's tired of the politics and nonsense and churches who don't give a darn about people's hearts. Are you with me? Our future church is going to be Jesus-focused. The pandemic is also teaching us about the sacredness of relationships. Over and over, I hear people say, it's just way better to be in church in person. There's something special about it. And these are the same people who sit in your chair for 60 minutes listening to a long-winded preacher, unable to sing, not shaking hands, not hugging. People who say, oh, there's something special about being in person. They're right. You know this. So the future church in America that has returned to Jesus, not focusing on nonsense, will value human relationships across politics, across socioeconomic divides, valuing the heart. Because remember what Jesus says, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, God is up to something new. As the prophet Isaiah says, do you not perceive it? Now we can go on and on trying to predict what the future of Christianity will look like in America. But the observation of the larger culture is usually a reflection upon our individual hearts. You too have been wondering is it worth it to come to church? Is it worth it knowing that it's better to stay healthier at home for some people, to sit down on the couch with a cup of coffee when uh, Chuck Todd is way more entertaining than Kevin Starcher, right? 
we are all asking these questions of where is my life? Where is my hope? Where is this God? Because this world is not very fun these days. But God is doing something new. And this, my friends, is the story of Christianity. God's love is revealed through pain and death and sacrifice. And today's sermon is less about Martin Luther's Reformation, more so about the Reformation of your own heart. Will you return to the one who gave his life for you, saying that you, you find your fullest life in love, God, neighbor? And the story of Christianity just doesn't end in sacrifice, does it? Our faith of a God who fails to leave you alone but pursues you, this story is one that ends in resurrection. Resurrection of churches following a pandemic. Resurrection of bodies into the kingdom of heaven. Resurrection of terrible life experiences happening now and the promise of a future in the kingdom of God. Will you return? Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us of pursuing other gods and adhering to terrible heresies in the church. Help us to turn to you because that's where we find true reformation. Not in Luther, not in Starcher, but in Jesus Christ. So help us to return to these words of loving God and loving our neighbor that we may find our life in light. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord gave his life for you. What will we give in return? 20 bucks? 10%? <gasps> God's really not concerned about any of that. God's concern is about your heart. As we come to this time of the offering, I invite you to pray to return to the Lord Jesus Christ.
friends, you may be seated. And at this time, I want to invite my friend, my brother in Christ, Mr. Kent Jennings, to come forward. A few weeks ago, this congregation elected Kent to serve as a ruling elder as part of the class of 2021. And Kent, it is a joy to be with you and an honor to be part of the church who recognizes the gifts that God has placed in you through the calling and your baptism for service to this church. So for this minor service of ordination and installation, I present Mr. Kent Jennings as ruling elder to ordain him to the ministry of service and governance in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Kent, we have a few questions for you from the constitution of our church. And in the transition up here, I have lost my place uh, where those questions are. Kent, in baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ and anointed with gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by this church through the voice of the church for service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, please show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow our Lord Jesus Christ, to love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve these people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of our Lord Jesus Christ? Will you? Some questions for us as we ordain Kent today. Do we, the members of the church, accept Kent as a ruling elder, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? Do we agree to pray for Kent, encourage him to respect his decisions, and to follow as he guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Do we? We're gonna to come to our time of prayer and in the act of ordination, we traditionally lay on hands, following the apostolic succession of ordination going all the way back to the time of Jesus in some ways. Due to COVID-19, Kent has allowed me to lay hands upon him, um, but I'm going to invite you to raise your hands as well as a symbol and as an expression of laying on of hands as we pray. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, for your servant, Kent, we give you thanks. We pray that you uphold and empower him with your wisdom, your love, your intelligence, your imagination, that he would faithfully serve you and work on behalf of this people. Lord, we pray for all of our elders and deacons that they would lead and serve faithfully 
with diligence, imagination, and love. Thank you for calling all of us to unique ministries of the church and for Kent especially to this unique role. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Kent, you are ordained and installed to the position of ruling elder. Let's celebrate. Kent, there's a session meeting November 17th. We have work for you to do, buddy. Ha, ha, ha. We come to our time of prayer. There's a lot to be praying for. Many of us know our dear friend Rex Pletcher uh, at Grace. They get weekly COVID tests. This week, Rex tests came back positive. So Rex asks for your prayers, for your love. Yesterday, he said, I'm feeling good. I said, let's keep praying that you feel this way for the next 10 days, buddy. Uh, many of us have friends, acquaintances in Colorado. There's a burden. Uh, I have a lot of friends and dear firefighter family in Estes Park, Colorado, who are hard at work uh, or evacuating. Uh, and our friend Nancy Skeen, she has a cousin in Grand Lake. Uh, Nancy's cousin lost her home to a fire. Thanks be to God, the winds have ceased, and they're expecting a foot of snow. But we pray for this tragedy to come to an end. We look on the news, our political climate, it's terrible. We turn to our Idaho COVID cases. They keep going up. Somewhere we've forgotten about our healthcare workers who are working 16-hour shifts, working day in and day out for the past seven months with no end in sight. Friends, there's a lot to be praying about. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have given us the gift of this day. And in a world that feels like it's going to hell, help us to be mindful of the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. For we know that this will pass away. And that in, in the end, your love wins. That's the story of the gospel. So Lord, help us to actually believe the gospel and help us to share this joy with all whom we encounter. For those neighborhood kids and our church kids and our mops kids that came in the parking last, last night that smiled for like five minutes and put a smile on all of our faces. Thank you for that reminder that our life really is about sharing joy and the hope that we have in Jesus. So if we're isolated in our room in assisted living, or whether we are enduring health diagnoses or financial uncertainties, help us to remember that we ain't going to find life in the opposite of those. We're going to find our life in Jesus. So help us to share, for you tell us that it's in giving that we receive. So Lord, help this church not focus on its bank accounts, but on how we can give. Give Jesus to our neighborhood and to this world. Lord, we pray for reformation in this church. Lord, we don't want to be a church of 1960. We want to be your people on fire in 2020 and 2021. So Lord, may the power of your Holy Spirit rain down upon not just this body, but our individual hearts. Oh, that we may find our light in our life in you. We pray for Rex. We pray for Jacqueline. We pray for those folks in Colorado. We pray for Nancy's cousin, Jenny. Oh, for all of those names upon our hearts that we lift up to you, we pray. And when we don't know what else to pray, help us to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have one closing hymn uh, this is beautiful. So may the words and the lyrics and the music soak into your hearts as we close our worship today.
Amen. Hallelujah, because COVID doesn't reign, sin doesn't reign, the Lord God Almighty reigns. And Reformation, that ain't something that happened 503 years ago. Friends, Reformation is happening now. And may it be so in your hearts as we return to the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So go forth to share the good news that the Lord God Almighty he reigns. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May all you reformed people go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.